Okay, church, good morning. Um, we're going to be in a handful of spaces, okay? And so I'm a quick talker, and so when we start going through Genesis, um, I'm going to slow it down, and I want you to see it. So for some of you guys, um, this is new. And so what I say about new is, I hear it from you all the time. People will come into this church and go, hey, Hunter, I've been in church off and on the whole life, but like I was the guy that did bring my Bible, and if I did bring my Bible, I didn't open it, I just put my arm around um, my wife and just kind of listened and, and went in and out depending on how good the message was. And, and so this is new for you to actually be here, be engaged. You might have a highlighter, you might not, but your Bible's open. And I want to encourage you to be engaged today. We're going to be in a lot of different spots and I want you, I beg you, I plead with you as this is one of the most important messages, not my words, but what I'm going to share with you in God's word that you'll ever hear. This morning is the message of salvation. Like you understand salvation, could you explain salvation? I'm going to ask that again here in a second. But this morning is we're going to step through where we've been and we're going to find ourselves where we are and you're going to see the invitation of glory. How, do man, how does man get to heaven in this message of salvation? And so if you're a kiddo, if you're a child and God is working on you and, and He is pulling you and you go, Hunter, like this is way past my pay grade. I'm barely passing second grade math, let alone understanding the mysteries of God. I'm going to break it down in a way I pray and hope that you understand today. So for my kiddos, open your Bibles. For my young one or even my older one that has gone to church and you checked a lot of boxes and you say that God is real and you believed in Him, but you might not be wrecked by the Spirit. You might fall into a Matthew 7 where God one day will stand before you and say, I never knew you. Maybe you've come to church and you've helped in BBS and you've written a lot of 10% checks, but you do not know who Jesus is or you're unsure of Him. Open your Bibles. Or if today you know that you are saved and you know that you are bought with a price, covered by the blood, born again, let's give praise and honor and glory to the one who saved souls and open your Bible. And so before I read, I've told you to turn your Bibles, or I don't know if I told you where to turn your Bibles. I want you to put a tassel in Genesis 43. We're going to slow it down. Genesis 43, it'll take us a second to get there. And as you turn your Bibles to 43, then I want you to go to John 14. We're going to read John 14, which is really the highlight of where we're going to be at this morning. And then we're going to pray. And so if you flip in your Bible, if you're a note taker, if you just want to know where we are this morning, to keep your heart and your mind engaged, to stir the affections of the Spirit in your life and in this room, could you explain your salvation to someone? If someone came off the streets and said, Hey, don't you go to that EC church. They're on fire. Aren't you guys building? Let me know your testimony. Let me hear your story. When were you saved? How were you saved? What did it mean to be saved? Could you communicate it? For my parents or my grandparents, if, if you had a child come to you and they said, Hey, granddad, hey, mother, hey, father, hey, brother or sister, God is working on me and I'm very curious and I have questions. What does it mean to be saved? Could you answer that question? It's not complicated. It's not rocket science. But what I've learned in ministry in my 20 years of following Jesus is many of us, the majority of us, probably could not communicate the answer to that. And so I want to, I want to press on you, for all of you guys here, for the one that's very confident in their salvation and the one that knows they're not saved, I want to press on you this is the reason that we cannot explain our salvation. Is it because I'm not just good with words and I've never really fully understood exactly, even though I think my mansion waits for me, or is it that you have not been wrecked by Jesus Christ? Which one? And so we're going to press in on that. I might even old school walk the aisles at some point, okay? But in the midst of our Lord's Supper, once again, I want to press in on that is do you understand what salvation is? And so I told you to flip in your Bibles to John 14, and we're going to read verses 1 through 6, and then we are going to pray. Once again, if you are a note taker, could you explain salvation? And then what we're going to be talking about today, how does man enter glory? Uh, we know that we've been invited, but how does man, how does the wicked enter the land of provision? 
So look at John 14, verses 1 through 6, and then we will pray. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believed in God, you check that box. But Jesus says, also believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you this. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and to receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. And where I go, you know, and that way you will know. Verse 5, And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, right? It's confusing. And how can we know the way? And highlight verse 6, It is the essence, it is the heartbeat of where we are today. And Jesus said to him, I am the way. Jesus said, I am the truth. And Jesus said, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let's bow our heads. God, we thank you for today. I am so thankful and encouraged by our music. As David said, it sounds like 600. In a moment, in a, in a season where people are in and out, at times for good reasons. We have family time. We're pulled in different directions. At times we simply chase things that we should not chase. And at moments you open doors to just family vacations. At times the summer can be hard for churches. But you have filled your church this morning. And we sing with loud voices. And we have open ears and hearts ready for your word. And in that light we say as a church, praise God. We are filled with the Spirit. We feel your Spirit in this place. And as I begged earlier, grab our children's ears and their hearts and their eyes to the gospel this morning. If someone sits falsely assured of their salvation, and there will be a day where they stand alone without Christ in front of a God who pours out His wrath, I pray, God, you shake them today and you save their soul. Lord, your word is ready. Your word is ready this morning, and I pray that we hear it. And in your precious and in your holy name, in the name of God the Father, and in the name of Jesus, his Son, and our Savior, the church says in harmony, Amen. 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 So do me a favor and look at chapter 43 in Genesis. And so we have had the Lord's Supper three out of the last four weeks. And that's been a curveball to some of you guys. I was joking with my brother Travis. Travis was raised Church of Christ. And I said, Travis, something's happening here, brother. Get your parents on board. I don't know if we'll do it next week, but we got it this morning. Make some phone calls, brother. Get your family over. Guys, we've had it three out of the last four weeks. And just to be honest with you, we would have done it four weeks in a row, but we literally ran out of juice. Okay? In my studies and in my time, in God's Word, I have just felt called to it. And that's when we do it, when the leaders, the pastor is praying over God's Word, we're preparing, and if the Spirit leads us there, we want to be genuine and faithful and authentic in it. We do not want to be the church, and which Paul would speak against that my brother Stoney read, where they did it every fifth Sunday, and they came together, and Paul said, what are you guys doing? You do it every quarter, you do it every fifth Sunday, you might do it every week to check that box. And he comes in and he looks at these people, plain church, like my kids play house. And he says, can I commend you for this? And what does the word say? No. And so in my studies, as I read this story of salvation at the heart of our story, in God's sovereign hand in Joseph's life, I have felt called to the Lord's Supper each and every week. Because chapters 43 to 47 is this gospel-centered call to repentance. Fall at the altar. Fall to your knees. God, I'm tired of running. I'm not leaving a brother here again. Like, I need you. If I have to be a slave to Egypt, I don't want to be free in my mess, right? That's the story. So we have a call to repentance, and then we have a celebration in forgiveness. I've been led here each and every single week, and hear me out, I've loved it. And so as I want you to see this explanation of salvation, you're going to have to flip the page a little, okay? 
And so we're going to go where we have been, but I want to see it built up. And I want you to see what salvation is, what salvation means, and the beautiful gift of God's salvation. So look at chapter 43, verse 1. I'm pretty amped up, so I'm going to slow myself down with a cup of coffee. That usually helps. <laughs> That's the opposite. Look at Genesis 43, verse 1. <laughs> Story of salvation. Hang with me. Now the famine was severe in the land. Amen. That is the beginning of salvation. Salvation begins with the fear of the Lord. Salvation always begins with famine. Do you hear me? No one in the history of man was ever saved without experiencing death. And so for you guys, the church is filled with people that have raised their hand at conferences and VBSs and ran to the altar and prayed prayers and checked boxes about people who want to avoid hell and just go to heaven. That's not salvation. We have grown up in this culture where people have sat with you and said, hey, do you want to go to hell? No, I don't want to go to hell. Well, this is what you need to do. That's not salvation. Repeat after me. Say this prayer. Do these things. You better get your tail into church. You better try harder. You better give and serve. You better watch your mouth and you better watch your words. That's not salvation. Salvation begins in famine. Salvation begins when God steps forward. You see His perfection. And in His perfection, you see your starvation. Amen? Amen. And so what does it say? Now there's famine was severe in the land. So what does famine do to us? Look at verse 18. Same chapter, just following. Now the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house. Joseph's house is where the food was. And they said, it is because of the money which was returned in our sacks the first time that we are brought in so that he may make a case against us and seize us. Not only seize us, but to take us as slaves and guess what? Also our donkeys. That's man's heart. Some of you guys are way too comfortable in your foolishness. You're so way too comfortable in your sin. This country, this world, this town is way too comfortable in its sin. But when God steps forward and wrecks you and you start to see your mess, you start to see your sin, you start to see what type of man you are and what you've chased and what you've worshipped and what you've given your best to and how you sin against God the Creator. How does man feel? Fearful. Oh no, like my good looks is not going to get me in. Like my daddy's last name, my money, how good I am at ball. Like this is not going to work. I'm a sinner standing before a perfect God. And what does man do? Oh no. There's going to be a day where I'm starving and I stand at the doorfront of all the food. And what am I going to do? I know this. God, the one who stands in perfect authority, is not going to allow me in. If anything, he's going to put me into a deeper hole. That's a heart. It's fearful. But here's the good news. This is what God's word says. That salvation begins with the fear of the Lord. We see the bad news quickly turn into the good news and how man responds. Look at chapter 44, verse 18. If I were you, I'd just be highlighting everything and connecting it. I'd be going home and I'd be reading this to my kids. Did you see the dots? Did you see the stars align? Do you see the story? Look at 18. When Judah, when the brothers were cut to the heart, when they were fearful, when they were scared, when they saw their sin, but they were changed, they wanted to repent, they didn't want this lifestyle anymore, they didn't want to keep running, what does Judah say? And Judah came near to him and said, Oh my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing, and do not let your anger burn against your servant, for you are even like Pharaoh. Do you see the gospel? He says, Have mercy on us, have grace with us. You are just like God. That's what he's saying. Look at verses 33 through 34. This is a man who has been cut to the heart. 
This is a man who's tired of running. He's tired of his sinful lifestyle. He's tired, of, he's tired of all the comfort of idols that are ridiculous and silly to chase. He's tired of all of it. And what does he say when Pharaoh and Joseph give him an opportunity to bow out and give another brother away and go home? Do you remember the story? With more food and more money than they came up with, with even asked for, he goes, listen, leave Benjamin. You've already left another brother for dead. Keep going on your sinful way. And what does Joseph Judah say? Therefore, please. Let your servant remain instead of the lad and slaves to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me, being Benjamin, lest perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father? Judah says, I'm tired of the sleepless nights. You ever been there? Like I prayed this when I sit with people and they have, they have conversations with me about salvation and the Holy Spirit pulling them. This is what I pray for them. As we close our eyes at the end of our gospel sharing, I go, God, wreck them. Wreck them. Let them not sleep tonight. Let them have a moment where they wake me up at 3 a.m. going, Hunter, your words and the gospel and the Spirit cannot leave my mind. I cannot rest. I cannot sleep. And that's what Judah says. He goes, hey, listen, I'd rather be a slave than actually dead in my freedom. Like, I can't leave another brother. Do you remember that sermon? I cannot leave another brother. I'm tired of the burden of lostness. I want freedom, even if it means I'm a slave to you. That's a good word. It's yeah. a good word. I would rather be a slave to you than a freedom in, than freedom in my lostness. I keep going with the stories where we were two weeks ago, but here's the good news of how God responds in grace and mercy. Look at 45 verses 1 through 4. Remember they they weighed, they've been weighed down. They're they're drowning in their sins. They see all of their problems. They're starving. There's problems in their home. Life could not get any worse. And now they're about to leave another brother. They don't know what's going on. And, and what does the image of God show them in verses 1 through 4, chapter 45? Then Joseph could not restrain himself. He could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him and cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept out loud so far, so much so, that the Egyptians all through the house of Pharaoh heard it. And then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? And his brothers could not answer him. For they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, which is a moment in an illustration of God's grace, forgiveness, and salvation. He says, come near to me. In the light of our Lord's Supper, this is the moment of celebration. We've said it like three weeks in a row. Not only does my brother live, but my brother is going to provide. My brother is going to forgive and show grace and mercy and love and let me keep my other brother. Now invite my whole family into the fold for the one that I left is not dead. He forgives me and loves me and now he invites me in. Guys, that's salvation. I, I, that is salvation. And then what we saw last week where one invitation turns to the arrival of 70, what do we see in 46, 26? All the people who went with Jacob to Egypt, who came from his body, besides Jacob's sons, wives, were 66 people in all. And the sons of Joseph were born to him in Egypt were two. And all the people of the house of Jacob who went to Egypt were 70. This is the story of salvation. Dad, what does it mean to be saved? Well, son, let me explain to you. Salvation is, is when God shows you His perfection. And in His perfection, you know that you need a Savior because you know that you are not. You know that I am sinful. I am unworthy. I am in trouble. I am starving. 
And now I stand at the door from the one who has all the food. And God has shown grace and mercy. He has invited me in. And now he has given me purpose. And says, now spend your life inviting everyone you know to come with you. That is the story of salvation. But here's the question today, if you are a note taker. What about Pharaoh? Remember, this isn't, this isn't Joseph's land. Right? So how do these brothers get past Pharaoh? So this is where we have, how does man enter heaven? How does man go to glory? How does the starving enter the land of provision? It's very simple and we see the need of Jesus. Look at verses 30 through 34 in chapter 46. And then we're going to go right into 47, so follow me. Will you highlight 30 all the way through 34? I want that highlighter to run out of ink by the time you get out of here. And Jacob said to Joseph, Now let me die since I have seen your face because you are still alive. And Joseph said to his brothers and his father's household, Highlight it twice if you got to, guys. is a very important theological truth. I will go up and tell Pharaoh. This is Pharaoh's land. How are they going to enter? They're one in a million. There's nothing special about these men. What are they going to do about Pharaoh? This is his land. And what does Joseph say? He says, listen, I will go up and tell Pharaoh. And I will say to him, my brothers and those of my father's house who were in the land of Canaan, they have come to me. Do you see the gospel? And the men are shepherds for their occupation has been to feed livestock. And they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. So it shall be when Pharaoh calls on you and says, what is your occupation? That you shall say your servant's occupation has been with livestock from our youth until now, both we and our fathers, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. Now let's read the very first six verses where we are this morning. And how does man enter heaven in the truth of the need of Jesus? So look at chapter 47. We know how we got here. Follow me. And Joseph went and he told Pharaoh, see Christ in this guy. Slow your mind down. Don't get lost in all the page slipping. See Jesus in this. Then Joseph went and told Pharaoh and said, my father and my brothers and their flocks and their herds and all of their possessions have come from the land of Canaan, and indeed they are in the land of Goshen. And he took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. And they said to Pharaoh, We have come to dwell in the land because your servants have no pasture for their flocks. There's a famine. If you haven't heard, we're in trouble. Right? But we have nothing to offer, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. I'm going to read it again. Highlight it, please. These men that are nothing special in the eyes of Pharaoh. They were raised in his home. They're not his kids. They stand in Egypt and they stand in front of this man. And what do they say? Please, please let us, your servants, dwell in the land of Goshen. And I love verses 5 and 6. It is the heartbeat of Jesus. Then Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, saying, Your father and your brothers have come to you, to you. And the land of Egypt is before you. Have your father and your brothers dwell in the best place of the land. Let them dwell in the land of Goshen. And if any of you know, if any of them you know have any competent men among them, then make them chief herdsmen over my livestock. Guys, through the lenses of the gospel, as I said to you a few weeks ago, seeing Jesus in all of these chapters and all of these verses and all of these characters, you see the heart and the story, and it teaches us everything about the need of Christ. 
This is the heartbeat. This is the bloodline of the gospel. We see the destruction of sin and what sin does to man. And then we get to see the freedom of forgiveness. And now we even see how does the wicked enter glory? So for my kiddos that might get lost in all the page flipping, let me explain the bad news before you get to the good news. Man has, eyes on me, man, woman, young, old, black and white, has a very serious issue, and that is that we live in a land of famine. Our sin and our false gods and our wickedness and our foolishness has created an issue where there is no food to eat. And the problem gets worse because the only food that we know is available is at the house that we have sinned most against. How do you knock on that door? And so here is the question of the day. Here is the question that the rich young ruler at BBS asked Jesus. And the whole world is wondering. And that we have a hard time communicating. And that scientists and theologians are all trying to figure out. How does the sinful wicked enter into the land of provisions and perfection? How is it possible? Do you remember Moses? Do you remember Abraham? Do you remember John? Do you remember every illustration in God's Word? Man, because he is sinful, cannot even be in the presence of God, let alone live in his house. You hear me? It says that I cannot even look at him, let alone live in heaven. Because we are sinners, if I took the best of you, let's call her Miss Vicky. If I took, you can laugh, she's great. If I took Miss Vicky and I said, hey, listen, she's our best shot. Let's stick her up into heaven. She would stick out like a sore thumb. Why? Because she is not perfect. Because she is a sinner. Because she has fallen short on a day, on an hour, on a minute, on a second basis. She is not good enough for heaven. And so are neither of us. And so how does man enter into this land of perfection and provisions when we so much have nothing to offer? And so these men stand before Pharaoh and say, Pharaoh, I got no money for you. My last name doesn't mean anything. There is nothing that I can do. I can't intimidate. I can't offer. I have no skills. So how does man enter heaven? For the sinners that are in this room, what is our shot? And what has the church said? Well, believe. We have all been raised coming out of the altar and getting our hair wet in the water. What do I got to do to enter heaven? Well, you got to not want hell. You got to pray this prayer and you got to jump in the water so we can all clap and say, I'm so proud of you. There's nowhere in the Bible that says any of those things. So, how does the wicked enter to the land of provisions? The Bible says when it comes to belief that even the demons believe. I've taught this a dozen times. Two dozen, three dozen, four dozen times. The Bible says that even Satan believes that God exists and Jesus is good and they're not going to be in glory. How many of us will stand before God, Matthew 7, and go, whoa, 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 brother, like, didn't I come to VBS and didn't I help and didn't I have an, an ECU shirt and write some checks and sing some songs? Like, I had my Bible open and when that man said highlight, I did it with all kinds of colors. Like, I did all of these things and what will God say? I never knew you. You checked a lot of boxes. You drank a lot of grape juice. You did a lot of things, but you did not understand salvation that can only come through a faith in my son, Jesus Christ. What does God's word say? Pharaoh looked at Joseph and said, your father and your brothers have come to you. you. Because here's the thing, guys. Do not forget in this story about whose land this is. This is Pharaoh's land. But here's the good news. Do you remember what we read in... We're not, we're not done flipping, but we're, we're almost done. I want you to flip to 41. Pharaoh made Joseph like himself. you remember that? Look at what God's Word says about... Joseph and Pharaoh in Genesis 41 39. Pharaoh and Joseph are like one. Chapter 49, verses 39 through 44. 
And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all these things, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all of my people shall be ruled according to your word. Do you see the gospel? Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. Do you see the gospel? Yeah. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all of the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck and he had him ride in a second chariot on his right side. And they cried out before him, bow the knee. So he set him over all of the land in Egypt. Now flip and see it, guys. See it, how beautiful God's word is when you are taught and you understand and you retain and the spirit moves. Now look at 46, verse 31, please. I love that you're engaged and I hear all those plays slip and praise God for you. Look at 46, 31. And so Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh. I will go up and tell Pharaoh and say to him, my brothers and those of my father's house, all 70, who are in the land of Canaan has come to me. Guys, this is the story of salvation. These men, no one was proud of them. They didn't do anything. They came in empty handed. They came in with nothing but sin. They came in with nothing but baggage and endless nights of, of not being able to sleep because of all of their foolishness. All of their land was bad. Their dad, their dad was depressed. All of these problems, they come and they say, man, the only place I can get some food are the people that I sin most against. And now they find out that he is alive and he weeps and puts his arm around them. And he goes, well, what about Pharaoh? Like, what does the brothers do about Pharaoh? And what does Joseph say? I am Pharaoh. Pharaoh has made me just as powerful as he is. And he says, listen, you don't need to go to Pharaoh. I will go to Pharaoh. That is the beautiful need of Christ. You don't got to flip, but I want to read you these verses in Romans 8, 34. Hang with me. Who is condemned? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? In 1 John 2, 1, my little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, here's the good news. We have an advocate that fought with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. Hebrews 7, 25, consequently, He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercessions for those who believe. And then one of my favorite chapters in all of the Bible, we read it as many times as we can. We got it posted on the wall as you walk down to the fellowship hall. Please keep flipping and go to John 17. If you have forgotten this, you never heard it, you've got a short-term memory, or you're visiting for the first time, this is a word from God that will blow your mind. Look at John 17 about the love of Christ. This is the intercession of Jesus on our behalf. We are all deserving to die in the famine of starvation. That's what we deserve. But listen how God treats us through Jesus. And look at John 17, verses 20 through 26. Now, in, in, in the story, this is right before, this is Jesus' prayer in the garden. He's praying for faith. He prays for His disciples. He is about to be taken to the cross. This is at the very end of his story on earth. And listen to who he prays for in verses 20 through 26. Jesus says, I do not pray for these alone, being the disciples, but also for those who will believe through their word. Who is that? It's you and me. That they will all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. 
And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that we may be perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and loved them as you have loved me. Will you highlight 24? If you're not wrecked by this, please hear my words because they're, they're hard words. If you are not wrecked by this, you are not saved. Very few things that you could say such a bold statement like this, but this is one of them. Jesus says before he goes to the cross, he says, Father, I desire that they also who you have given me may be with me where I am. How could you say such a thing? Jesus stands before God and goes, hey, listen, you know those guys that sold me into slavery for 200 bucks? You know those brothers of mine where I ended up spending a generation in prison? You remember those brothers? You know those brothers that were just jealous of that colored coat that I have and because my dad loved me a whole lot and threw me into a pit? You remember those brothers? Yeah, Joseph, I remember those brothers. What would you have me do to them? Please let them be with me. If you're not wrecked by that, then the Spirit is not in you. So how does the starving enter to the land of provisions? How does the sinful enter to the land of glory in heaven? As the rich young ruler asked Christ, what do I got to do? And what you have to do is to have faith in the one that can get you there. And that is the one and the only Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Savior of man. That is the only way. Amen. Amen. And so right now, if you look on social media, you turn on the news, you'll hear a lot of people talk about God, but you won't hear the name of Jesus enough. Jesus is the way. Amen. It does not matter what you do here on this earth. There will not be a day where you and I could stand in front of the perfect authority, in front of Pharaoh and go, Pharaoh, what do I got to do? That's not going to work. We've got to have Jesus that says, hey, David, I'll go to God for you. Hey, Hunter, hang back. I'm going to go to God for you. And Jesus goes to God, the Creator, the Father over the cosmos, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who speaks life into persistence. And He says, hey, listen, I want Jason with me. I want London with me. And what does God say? I have seen that they have come to you, so bring them in. That is why we need Christ. Because you will never be worthy. You will never be acceptable. You will never be able to give enough, serve enough, be enough, do enough. You need perfection to be with you in the presence of God. Yes. That is our story. Guys, understand the moment everybody wanted into Egypt. Right? Everybody did. There was nothing special about these men. They were one in a million. Everybody's knocking on Pharaoh's door. There's going to be a day where all of this ends. And everybody's going to be standing around going, where's the food at? And everybody's going to stand before God. But here's the thing. Some are going to be standing alone and some are going to be standing by Christ. Which one are you? Everybody's going to knock on Pharaoh's door. Please let me in. It says it in the Word. And God's going to look at you and you're going to be standing by yourself. And some are going to go, hey, listen, I thought all of this was a fairy tale. Joke's on me. Some of you are going to go, wait a minute, where's Christ at? Matthew 7. I thought I did all of these things. I thought I helped and I thought I served. And I didn't curse as much as my friend. Never murdered anybody. I didn't cheat on my wife. Like, like why aren't I accepted in? And Jesus is not going to be around. You've never understood salvation. You never understood grace. You never placed your faith in Christ. And then some of us are going to be standing in front of a perfect, righteous God who is full of mercy and also wrath. But Jesus is going to stand beside us with his arm around us and say, God, he's with me. Yeah. That's salvation. And so I'm asking you this morning and I'm pressing in your soul. Is that what you have? 
Or were you 13 at VBS and ran to the altar and raised your hand when someone said, who wants heaven? And you jumped into the water where the whole crowd applauded you. Or did your story start in famine? Which one? Because here's the reality. I've said this a million times at this church. Let's not be naive. You think everybody in this room saved? What does God's Word say about the road to glory? Not many on it. Church is not going to be a mega church in heaven. Do you understand the need of a Savior? I believe that God exists and I know that I am a sinner. I need a Savior. I need a substitute. I need an intercessor. And now God, I lay it down and I will follow Jesus to glory. Is that your salvation? Is that your story? Is that your testimony? Because if it is not, then you are living in shaky, dangerous ground and you just think that you have food but you are still in the land of famine. And you will die and you will go to hell. And it is something that we need to scream at the highest of our lungs and capacity. Put your faith in Christ. Fall to your face at the altar. God, please save me. There's nothing more serious. And here in that warning, here is the good news, like I said, Lord's Supper, that invites you. As we close, look at 47, 5, and 6. Genesis. Look at 5 and 6. Genesis 47, 5 and 6. We won't flip anymore. I don't think. I want you to see this. This is mind blowing once again. Mind blowing. Then Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, saying, Your father and your brother have come to you. And the land of Egypt is before you. Have your father. This is what I want you to hang on. Second time I've read it. Have your father and your brothers dwell into the best of the land. You underline it, highlight it, do whatever you got to do. In the best of the land. Let them dwell in the land of Goshen. And if you know any of them, be confident men among them. Make them chief herdsmen over my livestock. Guys, what blows my mind about this story, it starts in destitute. It starts in famine. It starts in starvation. It leads to provisions. It leads to forgiveness. It leads to freedom. It leads to family. And now somehow or another, an unspeakable understanding and thought, now it leads to rewards. How can man understand any of these things? Hear the truth, guys, about glory in heaven in the mansions that wait for us, if the story of the Bible was perfection is only allowed in heaven, man has sinned from the garden, so that is already over, and the only way to avoid hell is to place your faith in Jesus and to repent, but after you die, lights off, story's over, but you don't burn, that would be enough to fill the church. If the story was you can avoid damnation for eternity of burning forever by just believing in Jesus. But you don't get to go to heaven. You're not going to be rewarded for this. That would be enough. But somehow or another, what does God's word say? Not only will I let you in, you can have the best of the land. What did I do to deserve any of these things? Like, I sold that guy into slavery. And you're saying, not only are you going to fill my belly, not only are you going to provide me work and a job, but I get the best of the land. That is the gospel. And so I call on you this morning. Do you understand not only the need of Jesus, the perfection of Jesus, but the riches and blessings of Jesus? <clears throat> Jesus loves you so much to where he goes, hey, listen, not only do I want to invite you in and your family's family, your son's son's son, but I want you to have the best that I have around. And so if you sit here today and you are saved, and you know that you are saved and feel the Spirit, 
but your affections have not been stirred in quite some time and you haven't given him all the praise and glory and honor, do it today. God, the best of the land in which I do not deserve and I cannot earn waits from me and it is only because of your grace and mercy and in that we give you all the praise. As we pray here and bring our praise team up as we go into our Lord's Supper. <coughs> If you sit here today and maybe you're young or you're new to the church and you go, hey Hunter, I've never had the gospel or seen Jesus in that light. I know this for a fact, guys, because I've had this conversation way too many times. I know how a lot of you were brought up. I know the message that you heard. I know that you why you professed it and what you said. If you've ever sat in that light and you sit here today and you go, Hey, Hunter, I checked the box. I tried to avoid hell. I was scared to death of damnation. But I never understood the grace and the perfection and the goodness and the love of Jesus. Listen to me. The water waits again. And you go, hey, Hunter, it's embarrassing. I'm 40 years old. I can't come forward and go, hey, I thought I was one thing and I realize I'm not. Man, I'd rather feel uncomfortable today than burn tomorrow. Fall at the altar. Fall on your face. Jesus, save me because I see you and I need you and I love you. Let me in. Let me in. Guys, before we read and we pray and they sing, I stood in that light. Like I was born and raised not really in the church. I didn't have a Christian home. And if I ever went anywhere, it was Episcopalian, which is kind of a Kroger brand version of Catholic or Methodist. And I can say all of these things with full confidence because I have all of it. I've been through all of it. I got sprinkled as an infant. I went through the pointless situation of um, going through confirmation and I did all of those things. I was a pretty good kid. I never murdered anybody. I said, no sir, yes ma'am. I worked hard. People liked me for the most part. I thought I was in good shape that if famine ever hit, God would have me be the first one in. But listen to me, I did not know the power of Christ. I did not know it. And so just like we look at the Lord's Supper and go, well, what are we doing right now? This is some hollow, traditional, robotic form of unbelief what you guys are doing. You're checking a box which is worthless. I sat there with my baptism and going, man, how's a man dumping some water on my forehead at six months old? How does that mean anything? Like, where do you see that in the Bible anywhere? And I see the same thing about these people that are still in the altars repeating after me, saying some kind of prayer as the crowd applauds them and I go, man, what are you doing? Man, my question is so simple to you. Have you been changed by the invitation and the goodness and the perfection of Jesus Christ? Very simple. And if you haven't, if you haven't, I just pray that you humble yourself in the famine, fall to your face and go, God, I see it. I believe it. And I need it. Save me. Stand before the church. Stand before the people. Do not be shy, too proud, too foolish. To not stand before the church and say, God is my Savior. So I'm going to read you this in the call of repentance. And then I'm going to pray. And I want you to pray as they are singing, okay? This is a call to forgiveness. We've read it once, but we're going to read it again. We read it at the very beginning. It's in John. Jesus says to the men, Do not let your heart be troubled. You believed in God, believe also in me, the gospel. In my Father's house are many mansions. It's the good news. If it were not so, guess what, church? I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to my, my Father's house, to myself. That is where I am. That is where I'm going. And there may you also be. And where I go, you know, in the way you know. Thomas said to him, which many of us live this way, Lord, we don't know where you're going. We're confused on what you're saying. And how can we know the way before we pray? And Jesus said, I am the way. Jesus says, I am the truth. And Jesus says, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Will you bow your heads with me? God, we thank you for today.
God, I pray thanks upon you, and I plead with the people to open their ears and hearts to the call to salvation. God, if someone here is today and they've checked all the right boxes, but there's going to be a reality that they are going to stand before an all-perfect God and they're going to stand alone. They're going to stand alone because they've never believed. They're going to stand alone because they thought they did all of these worldly acts, but they didn't really understand salvation. Or they're going to stand alone because they always thought it was about them and not you. Lord, I pray you break them, you wreck them. You open their ears, the stars make sense, the dots connect. They see the gospel and the call of salvation. That salvation begins in starvation. It begins in famine and a call to repentance as they knock on the door. The brothers say, please let us in. I pray that if someone does not know you here this morning, we knock on that same door. God, let us in. And so there is sin in our lives, which should be all of us. Lord, I pray that we repent. As Brother Stoney said, let us look in the mirror, humble ourselves, not check a box, go through the motions. Let us be wrecked by sins, fall to our face, and celebrate in your forgiveness. In your precious and holy name, amen. amen. <clears throat>